To tell the story of the ancient people who lived in the American Southwest over 1,000 years ago, you have to start in Chaco Canyon. The Southwest is not easy living. This particular part of Northwest New Mexico is so dry and barren that it's hard to imagine any people living here, let alone a political and religious center the size of Chaco. Located 151 miles to the Northwest of Albuquerque. To get to Chaco, you have to take miles of washed out dirt roads. Keep your eyes up and your speed down as you travel this route. Wild horses cover the landscape in large numbers out here. These beautiful creatures were not around during the rise of Chaco. A symbol of just how much this world has changed in the last 1,000 years since construction in the canyon first began. When people think about ruins in the Americas, the pyramids in Mexico and the beauty of Machu Picchu in Peru typically come to mind. Many people have no idea that the United States of America holds some of the most spectacular archaeological sites in the world. You're going to have to take a drive through the desert to witness some of these for yourself. People have been living at Chaco for a very long time, way back into prehistory. The canyon experienced its major boom around 850 AD with the construction of some of the first great houses that still stand today. After the first great houses were built, the development continued here for another 300 years. It's estimated that over 240,000 trees were harvested and carried from both the Zuni and Chuska Mountains, 50 miles away from Chaco. There were no large domesticated animals in North America at this time to help with the transportation of lumber. Although the Anasazi did have road systems that stretched all across the Four Corners region and beyond, they did not have the wheel to help them move heavier objects. The trees and lumber left behind in Chaco Canyon show no signs of being dragged along the ground. These trees were likely carried the entire length. As you walk around Pueblo Benito, you can still see some of that wood today. This great house is one of the most magnificent ancient ruins you can view in the Americas. When you consider square footage, it is about the same size as the Roman Colosseum and bigger than the White House in Washington, D.C. Pueblo Benito is well worth walking through, but the real view lies from above on the high cliffs behind. If you're traveling all the way to Chaco, you might as well hike a few miles to the overlook above Benito to get an accurate idea of just how magnificent this building was and still is. Even more impressive than their architecture was their ability to recognize and view their environment as a ritual landscape that measured time, their location here on Earth, as well as our ever-changing location within the greater universe. When you first enter Chaco Canyon, one of the first landmarks you see is Fajada Butte. This butte sticks out prominently compared to the rest of the landscape and will almost force your attention upon it as you drive in. At the top of this butte exist three rock slabs, aligned up right next to each other. Behind these slabs of rocks is a spiral petroglyph. On June 21st, the day of the summer solstice, around 11 o'clock a.m., a ray of sunlight illuminates the top of this spiral. Within about 15 minutes of it appearing, the ray of light will have slowly moved down the center of the petroglyph, piercing the center and marking the final day of the sun's journey north before it begins rising further and further south after each passing day. Unfortunately, this is no longer possible to witness. In 1989, the slabs of rock shifted, forever changing the visual representation that the people who created this intended for the eye to see. Luckily, before this happened, an episode of the late Carl Sagan's Cosmos, The Harmony of the Worlds, 
captured this moment on film via time-lapse photography. With their attention on the sky, it is likely that the people of Chaco Canyon were perplexed and astonished as they witnessed a celestial paradigm shift in 1054 AD. This is the year that the entire world experienced a bright light in the sky that was not from the sun. The ancient Chinese and Japanese astronomers wrote about the phenomenon. This was the explosion of a supernova, which could be witnessed here on Earth for several weeks. This event would have been extremely significant for people who were so fixated on the sky. As you're hiking toward Penasco Blanco, a great house that I highly recommend you take the time and effort to see, make sure you look up before you begin your climb up to the cliff. Guarded by a flock of cliff swallows is one of the most spectacular petroglyphs in the United States. This image of a handprint, the moon, and a bright flaring light is thought to have been created around 1054 AD and is speculated to be an image of the great supernova that appeared in the sky at Chaco Canyon and the rest of the world for many weeks after. For the longest time, it was taboo among archeologists to try and tie together the Anasazi with the mighty empires south of the modern day American and Mexican border. This has changed dramatically over the years, and the lines for the debate have been moved. You have to remember that the imaginary border that separates the United States from Mexico was non-existent to the ancients that lived on the Colorado Plateau in Mesoamerica. The migration and trade routes that happened on these landscapes go further south than many cared to admit in the early days of Southwest archeology. span Evidence of this exists all throughout the region. At Chaco Canyon, we know that the elites enjoyed the luxury of cacao as one of their favorite drinks. Cacao, which is the main ingredient in chocolate, does not grow in the present-day United States, let alone the dry deserts of northwest New Mexico. Cacao is native to Central and South America. Despite this, it's made its way to New Mexico regularly. Even more bizarre, was the 1897 discovery of 30 scarlet macaw parrot skeletons that were excavated in the Chacoan Great House Pueblo Benito. Macaws are native to Central and South America, not New Mexico. These birds were likely used by the elites as a symbol of their power. Imagine the first time one of these birds arrived in Chaco Canyon. The astonishment the population would have felt when they first witnessed one of these birds talking like a human would have caused whoever possessed these birds to have enormous amounts of clout and status. There were also some more unsettling similarities between the Anasazi and Mesoamerica empires further to the south. For the longest time, these people were depicted as peaceful farmers that went about their business with little to no conflict or violence. This, of course, would be an inaccurate description of the history of any group of peoples. If you look close enough at the history of humanity all over the world, you will always find a dark side. There is evidence that shows signs of ritualistic sacrifice and cannibalism in the Southwest. In the 90s, an archeologist named Christy Turner kept coming across human bones with cuts that resembled the carving marks you would find on animal bones that had been butchered or processed for their meat. After doing a series of excavations at 80 different Chacoan sites, Turner found evidence of cannibalism in nearly half of them. By the end of Turner's study, he had collected over 300 examples of humans being killed and having their meat processed as if they were wild game. This subject is clearly controversial, but nonetheless, there's some interesting evidence that supports this. Skulls roasted over an open fire, butcher marks on bones, and DNA testing of human fecal matter preserved in the desert over time have all contributed to the growing amount of evidence that there was something darker that was happening here at Chaco. There are a few oral histories that provide some interesting context to back up some of this evidence. One story in particular told by the Navajo 
who were not related to the Anasazi but were neighbors to the further north, tells a story of the great gambler who ruled over the great houses at Chaco Canyon. The story tells of a powerful man arriving from the south and challenging the natives of Chaco Canyon to different games of chance. The gambler kept winning these games, allowing his wealth to accumulate over time. Eventually, people started wagering themselves and their families, only to continue to lose and enter a life of slavery under his rule. The great gambler eventually instructed these new slaves of his to start constructing many of the great houses, including Pueblo Alto, that you still see on the high points of the canyon at Chaco today. Although just a story, it is a documented one that you can read more about online today. So what happened at Chaco Canyon? Eventually the glory days began to fade, and a few hundred years after, the more rural cliff dwellers moved on as well. People started abandoning their settlements in mass, often leaving behind belongings in their dwellings and pueblos as if the decision to leave had been made quickly and abruptly. Drought has plagued the Southwest throughout a large portion of its recent history. Sometime around the 12th century, construction at Chaco Canyon had basically ceased, and the site gradually and then suddenly started to be abandoned. It is thought that much of the dry and arid areas of the Colorado Plateau were possibly more lush and wet when the Anasazi dominated the region. Soon after this 12th century drought began, Chacoan-like great houses began rising near Aztec, New Mexico, further to the north near the Los Animas River. This place became the new center of the Anasazi world for a short period of time and was likely a more ideal spot than Chaco as drought conditions continued to worsen in the southwest. It's speculated by many that a combination of political turmoil, drought, deforestation due to overlogging, and other environmental factors could have contributed to Chaco Canyon becoming less hospitable over time. Many clans traveled east to the Rio Grande River Valley. At Pecos National Historical Park, located about 75 miles to the southeast of Santa Fe, New Mexico, Pueblo started being constructed around 1100 AD, and the population significantly grew over the next 300 to 400 years until the arrival of the Spanish. This particular site is unique in that you can still see some of the original ruins from the more ancient past, as well as the construction of a mission. This area would play a major role in the Pueblo people's rejection of this new Christian religion that was being pushed on them by the Spanish with the Great Pueblo Revolt in 1680. A story I hope to tell at a later time. Another theory that has been gaining popularity points to evidence that shows a clan of nobles may have potentially migrated as far south to Chihuahua, Mexico, at the UNICEF World Heritage Site of Pacimé. The rise of Pacimé peaked sometime between the 14th and 15th century, well after the fall of Chaco. Pacimé, Chaco Canyon, and Aztec, New Mexico have many things in common that seem to be beyond just coincidence. All three sites sit along the same meridian. When you visit Chaco Canyon, Aztec, Mesa Verde, and other Anasazi sites in the American Southwest, one of the things you will notice are the T-shaped doors and windows. Clearly distinct from the other openings in these ruins, the T-shaped doors seem to represent some type of importance. These same T-shaped doors can be found at Pacimé in Mexico, about 700 miles to the south of Chaco Canyon. In the Mexican Sierra Madre Mountains that surround the Pacimé region, you can still find cliff dwellings that are strikingly similar to the ones that are found at Mesa Verde, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. Many of these cliff dwellings possess the same T-shaped doors. Archaeologist Steve Lexen, author of multiple books including the Chaco Meridian, argues that these were most likely a symbol of power or a way to mark a distinction between public and private spaces. Regardless of their use, their presence in both modern-day Mexico and the American Southwest indicate a clear connection between the two regions. People are always asking the question, what happened to the Anasazi? What caused them to leave? Where did they go? It is important to remember that the ancestral Puebloans of the American Southwest were made up of individual families that shared a similar culture, but were also made up with their own local autonomy. We're talking about a group of people who figured out how to farm on an extreme landscape 
that was unforgiving and constantly changing. Maybe there is no mystery. Maybe the different families and clans made decisions at different times that were individual and unique to their own personal circumstances. It's possible that some of these families simply did something they had always done to survive. They left, and this time they didn't come back. When you travel through this desert and view these ancient ruins for yourself, a visual story begins to play in the brain cinema within your head. Nearly 1,000 years ago, the canyons and alcoves of the Colorado Plateau were not as quiet as they are now. Every petroglyph you see, piece of corn you stumble upon, dwelling you walk through, it all captures the imagination. Thanks for watching Wild World. I'll be making more videos on ancient American sites, incredible landscapes, oddities, and really any interesting story or piece of history that I find throughout my travels. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, share, and subscribe. This series is just getting started.